thanks for coming here. Uh, Alok and the rest of the ASEAN team, uh, thanks for inviting me and uh, Walmart for sponsoring this event. Um, as Alok mentioned, my name is Gaurav Kumar. You can simply call me GK. I'm co-founder and CTO of Redlock. I have spent all my life in cloud security and security in general. Little bit about us. Uh, we co-founded Redlock in 2015 to focus on cloud security problems. We are funded by top venture firms in uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And we have uh, dozens of customers, and we protect millions of resources every single day. All right, the fun stuff. Um, the agenda for today is we will be talking about what is cloud security, whose responsibility is it, and how is it different from traditional on-premise security, and how to solve it. In fact, I will say that I will be very lucky if we leave this meetup with more questions than answers. Because these are the questions we're going to answer anyways. But it will be great if you can think about more problems in cloud security, depending upon what we discuss. Uh, you don't even have to wait for a Q&A section at the end. If you have any question or comment, raise your hand, and let's talk about it. Let's make it more interactive. All right. Just curious, by show of hands, how many of you are developers? All right, so just about everyone. <laughs> um, so I'm sure that you know, you have heard of the word cloud, cloud computing. Some of you might already be using AWS, GCP, Azure, and some other cloud. What comes to your mind when you think about the word cloud, cloud computing? Some of the words that I can think of are it's flexible, it's elastic, it's on-demand, auto-scale, right? Uh, in general, uh, it's all about speed, the agility, uh, DevOps, moving faster, releasing software fa uh, at faster pace than before. At the same time, what comes to your mind when you hear the word security? Security is like a gatekeeper. It's a safety barrier. It stops you from doing things sometimes. So as you can see, the word cloud security is, it's a very challenging word, challenging phrase to actually understand. On the one hand, we are saying that, oh, with the cloud, you can move faster. You can deploy a software at a much faster pace than before, and yet, when we say security, it's like, that doesn't really make sense. How can we deploy software faster if security is going to stop us from making some obvious mistakes? And perhaps this is the reason that we keep hearing about these cloud security related incidents. This is just a really a sample of small cloud security incidents from last couple of months, maybe a year. Uh, we have seen cloud misconfiguration. Uh, some of you might have already heard of S3 buckets. People misconfigure S3 buckets. S3 buckets are um, Amazon cloud storage solution where you, it's like a blob storage. So think of it like a key value pair. Sometimes people make mistake of giving more access than required. Uh, I would say 99.9% of the time, it has to be by mistake. Nobody wants to build insecure software. Uh, sometimes you want to move faster. For example, if I want to share a file with you, what is the fastest way? I can just upload it to S3 and give you a link and you can download. But if I say that, oh, you are required to enter a password, then you may not even download it. So sometimes people make this mistake, mistake of just giving very broad access to these cloud services. And I'm not here picking on S3. That's just an example. Almost every cloud service provider has a cloud storage like S3. 
we heard about Uber compromised. Uh, somebody compromised AWS keys, which are basically like, uh, think of like API token, think of them like username and password. And the attacker got access to, uh, I think, driver information. Tesla, uh, this compromise, compromise was actually de detected by Redlock. Uh, so at Redlock, we have a team which, uh, which is always looking for cloud security related issues. So we discovered that one Kubernetes server was exposed to the internet and the attacker was doing crypto mining. Uh, you can read up more on our blog if you want. But the important thing here is not, not to really uh, pick on any specific cloud service provider. The important thing is that we, from, from the last, I would say, one year or last two, three years, we, are, we have been seeing an uptake in cloud security incidents. Now, why is that? By the way, Gartner says that by, 95, uh, by 2020, 95 percent of the cloud security failures will be due to customers' fault. But rather than thinking in terms of pointing fingers at, oh, this, is it a cloud service provider problem, or is it a problem of the users of the cloud? Let's think let's answer let's try to answer the question about responsibility. Whose responsibility? Is it? By the way, here are just some of the um, some of the stats that we uh, 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 we came up with uh, a few weeks back. Uh, Fifty-eight percent of the enterprises have exposed cloud storage service, and here I'm talking about S3-like mis misconfiguration. Eight percent of the enterprises had crypto jacking activity. Crypto jacking, if you don't already know, is basically when an attacker is doing crypto mining by either compromising one of the server, or we, now we have seen some examples where just by visiting a website, a process runs in the background like a web worker, and it is doing crypto mining. 66% uh, of the databases are not encrypted. Uh, this is really important from compliance perspective. 73% of enterprises allow root user activities. Um, the root user activity is much, it's more like an AWS specific term, but effectively it means that this root user is like a God user. This user can do anything and everything possible within the context of cloud account. And, so, and we have seen that 73% of the enterprises are still using the root account, which is a really a bad idea, because think about it. If that account is compromised, there's a possibility that company might even go out of business. And in fact, it, has, it actually happened. I think I, one or two years back, there was, funnily enough, a backup company. Their cloud service was compromised, the cloud account, and attacker deleted all the data. And guess what? Because that was a backup company, they had backups of their backups of backup. It's really like a meta term right now. But attacker deleted everything, the data and the backups. And the company just went out of business. So it's scary to, to uh, actually <laughs> think, think about it, uh, like what can happen. 40% um, of the access keys have not been rotated in 90 days. This, to be honest, I'm not too worried about because raise your hand if you have not changed your password in the last one year. There you go. Um, I know some of you are not raising your hands, but it's, it's very well known fact that people just don't change their passwords. And what happened, and, and I would really encourage you to think about it because if your password is compromised, it's not that only that service is compromised, the one that you are using the password for. People sometimes reuse the password at many different websites. In the context of the cloud, these access keys are like username and passwords. And if these are not being rotated, 
means that there's a much larger attack surface area. 16% uh, of enterprises with potential account compromise. Um, this is based off uh, our analysis of uh, overly broad permissions. Uh, we actually see it now much more than before that people are now getting way more access than they need. What happens when you are trying to perform an operation and you get access denied, authentication failure? You probably go and talk to your, the IT administrator or the cloud admin and say that, hey, this is not working. And maybe you will spend some time with your admin and eventually admin will like, ah, fine, here, I give you admin access. And then you will be happy and the admin will be happy. You both will be able to get your job done. And what happens after that? You are still an admin a year later. And we see it happening at a much larger scale, and which is a big problem because if your account is compromised, the attacker can do really nasty stuff, which otherwise wouldn't have been possible if you had if you are following the principle of least access privilege. Any questions or any comments, any war, war stories related to these items that anybody would like to share? So the, so the percentages add up to more than 200%. So what's the deal with that? So it's the percentage of, the, of our customers that we found this specific problem. Yes, so just about any security problem. So the question was that, it's not a question, more like a comment, I believe, right? And uh, which is very, very true that this problem is much bigger than we imagine. Uh, think of it this way. All the news that you keep hearing about this company got breached, this data is out there, attackers are, um, doing crypto jacking, doing all sort of nasty stuff. This is the stuff which we get to hear. What about the stuff we don't even get to hear? And I think these stats just, just, just sort of explain why, why the case is. Okay, so. Um, we do recognize that it's a big problem. What are people doing to solve this problem? And whose responsibility is it anyways? Often, oftentimes we think that, oh, we are using a cloud service provider, so it's the cloud service provider responsibility. Uh, and so we don't have to worry about security. Not really. So to answer this question, whose responsibility is it, customer or cloud service provider? The answer is the most politically correct answer always. It depends. It really depends upon whether it's, you're talking about a SaaS service, platform as a service, or infrastructure services. As you can see from the slide, the SaaS service is where you have to worry about just the data, not much. Everything else is taken care of by the SaaS service. Um, when it, when it comes to platform as a service, you have to worry about data and application. And when it comes to infrastructure as a service, you have to worry about a lot, many, lot, lot more. But you know what? Since more and more customers are now using cloud, they are, they are lift and shift projects which are moving entire data centers to the cloud. It's really important to understand that who is responsible for doing what in the cloud. Uh, sometimes people have this confusion that, oh, we just use AWS, GCP, Azure, SoftLayer, or uh, any other cloud which I'm not able to recall. You will be fine because, hey, this is not my problem. This is someone else's problem. And it's very easy, right? It's very easy to say that, oh, I'm not responsible for this. So 
the key point here, the key takeaway from this slide is that as a consumer of the cloud, you are still responsible for majority of the things, majority of the resources you are using in the cloud. Now, let's try to get a little bit more specific. The problems you need to solve. Just because you have moved to the cloud does not mean that you don't have to worry about applications, host, network traffic, user activities, or resource configurations. And in a moment, we will talk about how cloud security is different from on-premise security. But these are still the problems, right? Just because you move to the cloud, the problems are not, they have not gone away. You still need to address them. The cloud service provider will only do so much. For example, uh, when you launch a database in some of the cloud service provider environment, you have an option, you have an option of setting encryption true or false. But you still have to set it. It's not like someone will automatically set it for you. Uh, the example that we keep hearing in the most often, the S3 buckets, like it's not like cloud service providers are not doing their job. In fact, after all these S3 buckets uh, leak, any time you try to make a S3 bucket public, you get a big warning. You actually get a warning twice that you are doing something really funny. Just, just be careful. Yeah. So the question is, if I just set up my private cloud, how is it different from a data center? That's a great question, actually. Um, it actually goes back to the definition of cloud, right? Think about it. People have been using data centers for several decades. It's not a new thing. But cloud is somewhat a new thing. So how is cloud different from, an, from a data center? And whether the cloud is private or public doesn't matter. Cloud is cloud, right? And the problems are somewhat more severe in the public cloud space because it has larger uh, threat surface area. Well, isn't multi-tenancy another issue in the public cloud? Yes, yes. So there are several other host of issues that you need to worry about. But fundamentally, what is the difference between, an, with, uh, between a cloud service and just like regular data center service? The thing is, for me or people who work in this area, I think we have all come to realize that cloud means doing things in infrastructure as a core, doing things more declaratively, doing things using APIs, having the ability to define your desired state and let the system configure itself to achieve that desired state. Um, example, in the old world, People used to have FTP servers. I think I'm sure there are still tons of FTP servers out there. FTP servers are somewhat like S3 buckets or other cloud storage services. What makes things very different is it's the same issue, but, in a di but the approach is very different. Like if you want to, and, and actually I'm going to be talking about that in I think next Slide, yes, where you will get some more examples. Um, that's where you, I will be able to really answer the question, but, uh, but just to answer the question right now, the, the fundamental difference is that the way you do things in the cloud are very different from how you do it on, on, on an on-premise system. And in fact, that slide is coming up. All right. How many of you can actually understand that IP tables command, just curious. Ah, quite a bit number of, number of people actually. All right, so firewalls. I'm sure everybody has heard of them. There's actually, I think, even a movie called Firewall. What is the difference between traditional on-premise versus cloud security in the context of network? So here I'm giving you an example where I want a network to be configured such that my web server listening on port 443 
can receive connections only from a load balancer because I don't trust anyone else. I just want my load balancer to be able to talk to my web server. Simple enough. The very first command is IP tables, which is a Linux firewall command. Here we are saying IP tables dash p dash a is like an input incoming connection p is protocol tcp dash s is for source and here i am specifying my source 1.3 1.2.3.4 which is an ip address uh, most likely my load balancer ip address and i am saying my destination port is 443 and the action which is dash j accept it basically means that I want to allow incoming connection on port 443 from source IP 1234. How will you do that in cloud? In cloud, the IP, IP address don't really mean much in the sense like, of course, you need IP address, but they are changing all the time. Uh, how many of you have used Docker? Oh, quite a bit. Every single time you start a Docker container, you get a new IP address. If you launch 1,000 virtual machines today, shut them down, and start over one hour later, you will get different IP addresses. So, it's in, so in such elastic environments, how are you going to set IP addresses? It's very hard. And that's why I'm giving here an example on, uh, of AWS. This command, AWS, which is basically CLI of, of for accessing AWS, is basically saying AWS EC2, which is the uh, compute service, which is also responsible for security group configuration. Allow security group ingress. I think we can understand that. This is about incoming connection. And I'm saying group ID in, in, in cloud, you always have this resource ID, so this doesn't, mean, doesn't really mean much for this conversation. But again, the protocol is still TCP and port is 443, and security group is security-load-balancer. Now, as you can already observe, I have 1234 one, and SG-load-balancer, they are in bold. They actually mean something, which is, in the first command, I had to specify an IP address. But for the cloud version, I do not have to specify any IP address. And that's what makes things entirely different on how cloud works versus your regular on-premise IT services. I hope that answers the question, like, what will be different? So this, this, this is the difference. Now, I mentioned that in the old world, people used to have FTP servers. And uh, the, I don't know if you know uh, if you have ever used one of those FTP servers where you can just enter uh, your uh, anonymous as username and password as your email address and hit enter, and you will get access. Um, let's, let's talk about it. Here, I am showing two, two screenshots. The first screenshot is actually from Microsoft FTP server. And here, I am basically configuring it and saying that anonymous users can access this particular server. And the, on the right-hand side, I'm configuring my S3 bucket. And I am saying that grant public read access to this bucket. This is the difference of between an IT between on-prem IT world versus cloud world. It's the same problem, but how you do things are different. But the most important thing is who is responsible for performing that action. Back in the days, you actually never had to worry about configuring FTP servers because there used to be a dedicated security team. Their responsibility is to make sure these services are properly configured. People used to follow a waterfall model. 
where they will simply build application and then it will go through security review, then infrastructure review, then it will get deployed to some staging environment, then production. There were several gatekeeping controls available. But in the modern DevOps world, how many such controls are available? These days, developers are writing cloud formation template. And these cloud formation template, which is again an AWS specific term, but a cloud formation template tells how you want your environment to be configured. So you can say that, oh, let's suppose I am building a web application. So I need a database. I need a cache, like a Redis cache. I need uh, two virtual machines. And then I can say that I want this security con group configuration. I want my web servers to be allowed to be exposed to internet. My database should be accessible only by uh, my web server and then you have some cache server security group configuration. All of this is being defined by developers or the DevOps organizations. And that's what makes cloud security very hard to actually get it right. Because you just run this cloud formation template and whatever is there in the template will get deployed. And it will be fast, it will take probably half an hour, maybe an hour, everything is up and running, everybody is happy, but do we actually know what is out there in that cloud formation template? I personally have come across cloud formation templates where people have put the source IP address as their home IP address, their office address, their office IP address. They will simply go to whatismyip.com, look out, find their IP address, and put that in the cloud formation template. Why? Because it's easy. I don't, I don't want to VPN. I don't want to enter, go through the two-factor authentication. It's just super fast. I can just directly access my web server. So the key takeaway is that cloud security, although um, is very hard to get right, the fundamental principles still apply. Like in the old world here, I'm showing that you have a poor configuration, and here you have a poor configuration for the S3. What, what is important that, that you need to have controls at the right place and right time so that these bad configurations are not pushed to the cloud. All right. Um, Let's talk about, so we have talked about a lot of problems, like what is going wrong? How can we make it right? What are all the techniques? What are all the philosophies? What are all the methods available to you? So here I will be talking about some of these methods. Primarily, there are, I would say, two methods. One is inline proxy, and second is API-based solutions. And the third type applies only to only infrastructure cloud, which is much more agent-based. Um, let's talk about one by one. Inline proxy model. In this model, you basically create a choke point, and you say that all of my data and all of my management will go through this central control. Although I'm um, saying security vendor in, uh, in, in that diagram, it could be very well your homegrown tool. It doesn't really have to be like a third party commercial solution. A lot of people use simple Linux IP tables, firewalls, and NAT gateways. There's nothing wrong with that. But here I'm just using this as a, just as an example. So you have an option of routing all of your management calls and your data calls through a central pane of glass. And you can do your security evaluations there. So you can say that, oh, this, um, if user is trying to modify something from a, a location which is not California, then decline it. But there's a problem with that. And there are a lot of advantages to this approach, this approach too. 
The first advantage is that we get deep traffic inspection. Because these devices, or even your homegrown software, has visibility to everything. Every single packet, every single management command is being routed through it. So you get immediate access to the data. You do get, and, and as such, you do get deeper security. Uh, so you can solve some of the use cases like detecting malware. You can do inline encryption. Uh, but the most important aspect of doing, of having inline proxies is that it allows real-time inspection and remediation. If something, if, if the request is bad, you can immediately block it. What are the cons? The first is extremely intrusive. And I would say it's almost not very cloud-friendly, to be honest. Uh, because here you have to think about asking every single user of the cloud, whether it's a developer or IT ops, DevOps, SecOps, business administrator, whoever, to actually go through a specific URL or to do VPN before you can access the cloud service. And that adds a lot of friction. In fact, uh, sometimes, people who, de who deploy this software, they basically say that we move to the cloud so that we can do things faster, but we are now back to square one. Whatever the advantages we were getting from cloud, they are all gone away. And that's why you will see that cloud security as an industry is, I won't say moving, but sort of gravitating towards using more and more API solutions. But at the same time, um, we will talk about some of the uh, disadvantages of using API solution. Uh, another big pain point is that it's not very scalable. Like every single cloud service provider has this auto scale capability. Um, and you can configure your auto scaling groups in a way that, oh, if my web server is like 90% CPU usage, spin off new servers. And Cloud service provider will simply spin off new number of servers and you will be just fine. But how are you going to make sure that the new servers are also routing their data through this central choke point? And that's where there is a lot of friction. API model. In this model, we are not routing anything through a, through a central choke point. The way these solutions work, and you are welcome to develop everything, uh, anything of your own. In fact, there are a lot of uh, companies who have built a lot of homegrown solutions for their cloud. And all of these solutions will basically read the data through API and tell you whether this is good or bad. For example, if there is a user who has delete access on a very critical cloud storage bucket, but user has not used that service in a very long time, uh, you can simply make an API call, figure, figure out the username, and say, this is a bad user, uh, remove access. Or I would say even better example will be, you can simply query, give me my cloud bucket list and their configuration. And you can analyze the configuration and say that, oh, this cloud bucket looks very suspicious. Why does it have public access? And you can then talk to the owner of that bucket that, hey, this is badly configured. And this is actually also a con of using this service, which is it's not in line, which is it actually prevents you from taking action in real time. When that bucket was being created, at that point of time, you were not able to stop it. So you can just do faster polling on the, on, on the configuration. So instead of querying the state of the cloud buckets every few hours, every few minutes, you can query them every few seconds. But then you run into a problem, which is rate limiting by cloud service providers. So you can only make n number of calls uh, for a given service. 
And obviously, uh, you are limited by the visibility provided by the APIs. The good thing is that almost every, every vendor out there is 100% API driven. Uh, uh, in fact, on Azure specifically, you can do more stuff using API than their web interface. So this is not necessarily a problem. And finally, the agent model, which is much more suited or much more applicable for infrastructure clouds like, again, AWS, Azure, and GCP, uh, these agents are like just binaries, software binaries running as a service on your Linux and Windows servers. And they allow you to get much more visibility into the system than otherwise possible. So for example, if someone performs a SSH logging to a server and reads the Etsy shadow file, copies the file over to some S3 bucket and then reads the data, such use cases are difficult to detect without using an, an agent because the cloud service APIs are limited to only the management layer. They don't go deeper into the machine itself. Uh, the good thing is that more and more cloud service providers are now starting to support visibility within the virtual machines so that you can read at least uh, the log data. The cons are obvious too, which is, which are, Deploying agent is not easy. You have to test them out, and if something goes wrong with the agent, you may have bigger problems. Uh, specifically, some of the agents are actually kernel modules, so if there's a bug within the security agent, your kernel might just panic, and it will just bring down your service. Uh, as, an, as an industry, this is a, a, a very big challenge uh, because it takes time for these agents to mature. And, these, and, if, and the only way you can make them mature is by testing them out. And it takes time before you will find an agent which has been better tested, supports large number of uh, virtual machines and, and operating systems. Uh, but more interestingly, I would say that especially from the cloud perspective, we are seeing that almost every cloud service provider is providing more and more managed services, like database. Today, you don't have to install Postgres or MySQL on a virtual machine. You have Amazon RDS. You have Google. Uh, Google also provides uh, Postgres database, and Azure just G8 their service, uh, I think, yesterday. So instead, instead of you managing a database yourself, the cloud service provider is actually managing the service for you. So on those services, you do not have capability to perform like a SSH login and install the agent. You are completely limited by whatever the cloud service provider will provide access to. Having said that, um, if you have use cases which can only be addressed by having deep visibility within the virtual machine, agents are still the best way to go. Uh, if you are worried about more the management layer, poor configuration, user access, and network configuration, network visibility, those things are better handled by APIs. So pick and choose. First, figure out what kind of security problems you are, uh, you should be solving, and then pick the solution. There is no clear winner. I cannot say that use inline model versus out of band versus agent. Key takeaways: Cloud is here to stay. We all know. Uh, just nothing much to talk about. Don't be afraid of it. Although you keep hearing that, oh, this data was compromised, that data was compromised, that's not necessarily a problem. What are the chances that if you were using an on-prem service, it will not happen? It might still happen. 
the example that I gave you before where somebody could configure FTP server and allow anonymous access, that can still happen, right? So cloud is not inherently secure by any means. It's, it's the user education which is lacking, where people need to understand what is the shared responsibility model and what are they responsible for. Uh, you need to realize that your existing tools, which used to work on the on-premise world, are very hard to work with in the cloud for the, same, for the same reasons that we just talked about. Things are fundamentally very different in the cloud. Finally, whatever architectural solution you choose, whether it's inline, out of band, or agent, just make educated decision there that there is not a silver bullet out there that's going to fix your security problem. You have to make some trade-offs. And these trade-offs are, these trade-offs should be made based upon your analysis of your risk. So with that, finally, um, at Redlock, we do a lot of uh, cloud security research. So go ahead and uh, read up our blog uh, just a sneak preview, uh, within two weeks we are publishing a very interesting research. Uh, so I won't talk much about it, but it's very interesting. It's very specific to cloud security. Uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. So the comment is that uh, these services are not as secure as one might think, and they should not be offered to the public in general. Um, so <laughs> until, until, until they can assure about and that they are secure. So the question is, what is the mix between the internal threat vector versus external? <sighs> Let me give the first politically correct answer. It depends. The internal actors are very hard to detect. Why? Because First, well, first of all, they are internal. And to figure out whether that activity that is happening is good or bad, it's a very difficult problem to, it's a very difficult question to answer. So what is the mix? Really, I don't think so anybody should even try to answer that. The more important, I think, uh, the, the question that uh, everybody should be asking is, do you have controls? Do you have visibility into what is happening inside your network versus the, the, the public access. And if you have that visibility, that's when you can detect it. I think people lack that fundamental visibility into these environments. And without that visibility, it's very hard to answer which is worse. But uh, my take is that, yes, I think internal one is harder to detect, but the risk is way, way more than the public one. Yes. Um, I mean, honestly, I don't know. We are just sitting here, standing here. Do we know who has access to our data in the cloud? We just don't know. We have trust, right? And I guess that's, <laughs> that's another po <laughs> politically correct answer. You just have to trust. Can I comment on the block storage-based storage solutions versus cloud storage security? My take is that obviously blockchain is very popular these days. It's a buzzword, it's very fancy. Billions of dollars are being invested. The reality is that how many people actually understand how a blockchain works? Um, you know, the Ethereum network, what happened with that a few years back? Uh, somebody compromised it. Somebody made, in theory, millions and millions of dollars. I think maybe hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe. What did the Ethereum network do? They simply forked the, chain, the, the blockchain. They said that we don't care about this blockchain. This is the new blockchain. And there were a lot of discussions in the community that, huh, wait a sec. Blockchain, by the fundamental nature, nobody owns them. Nobody can make that decision. What is there on the blockchain? is authoritative. You simply can't say that a group of people will decide that this is not valid. 
So the blockchain or the Ethereum community came together and said that this is really bad stuff. It, 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 uh, we're going to simply have a new blockchain. Do we, so, so my comment will be, it's very hard to even detect these kind of issues. What are the chances that somebody already has access to my private key associated with, with, my, uh, with my wallet? I don't know. I don't, honestly don't. I actually have some uh, Ethereum coins. And there is a private key somewhere. I don't have access to it. And I can't answer that question, who has access to it? So which is more secure? The, the centralized cloud security solutions versus the blockchain-based systems? Uh, again, it depends. <laughs> it depends upon, uh, do you trust the blockchain enough? Nowadays, actually, I think there are not hundred, maybe thousand plus uh, cryptocurrencies available, right? There had been cases where somebody simply launched a coin, the ICU initial coin offering, made the money and just the coin vanished, right? Can this happen for us uh, <laughs> on a uh, centralized system? Can an administrator go raw, rogue and perform some malicious action? Sure, that can happen. But at the same time, we have these cases where somebody finds a vulnerability in these blockchains and makes this illegal money. So things can go wrong either ways. I think you have to just, I, I would just say that just understand the fundamental nature of these block, blockchains before you go and invest in them. Have you ever dealt with flaws in the underlying providers like Google or Amazon rather than like the client this configuration? Uh, say it again. So, have you ever dealt with security flaws in the the providers themselves, like mistakes Amazon and Google have made, rather than oh. clients configuring the cloud services wrong? Um, that's a good question. Let's just say that. Some cloud service providers could have done a better job at alerting people when they are making poor choice to that extent. But I would say that in general, cloud service providers have done a great job at ensuring uh, the hypervisor layer is secure. Uh, for example, when uh, the recent uh, Spectre vulnerability was announced, uh, Google worked with the top uh, cloud service providers. They were aware that this needs to be fixed. They actually fixed it before we, we even got to know. Personally, I worry about the second tier or the third tier of those cloud service providers who were not notified. And then one day they wake up and say that there's a big vulnerability which impacts every single cloud service provider. And the top tier of cloud service providers were fortunate enough to work to, to solve the issue. Uh, but in general, yes, I would say they have done a great job at uh, securing the, uh, the bottom layer, which is anything below the VM. But again, other than that, on anything on the VM and above, the configuration is still a user responsibility. And as, a, as I said, to that extent, uh, we keep finding these issues where people share stuff knowingly or unknowingly, and they don't even get to know. Yeah, so the question is, do we need to worry about encryption in the cloud? Uh, within the local on-prem networks, uh, you have somewhat more trust. You, can, you, you, have a, you have somewhat more tolerance for encryption. That is, you don't need encryption much. But how does this equation change in the cloud? Tricky question, because to be honest, I think whether it's an on-premise network or cloud, you should be encrypting, no matter what. Uh, well, the, what was the number one reason that, pe that people 
were not doing encryption before. I think a lot of people are still not doing it, but the number one reason was that encryption used to have a lot of impact on the computing resources. Your CPU usage will go high. This is year 2018. Every single CPU processor that you are using has a specific cryptographic functions built into it. Uh, you will hardly notice any impact on by using encryption. So whether it's cloud or whether it's an on-premise network, you should do encryption. And it really helps. I mean, I would say that um, if you want to use self-signed certificate, at least, fine, that's fine, use self-signed certificate. If you cannot use a free certificate authority like Let's Encrypt, but at least you will get some value out of it. So whether it's on-premise network or cloud, you should be encrypting the data. Because A, you don't lose anything, and uh, it only helps you get more secure environment. Uh, on all the clouds, encryption is damn easy. All you have to do is, I think on AWS, you simply set a flag on to say that I want my database to be encrypted. On Azure, it's the same thing. You simply set a flag. I want my database to be encrypted. I personally like Google a lot in this case because on Google, you do not get that option because Google by default has encryption. You don't even have to switch that, switch the flag on. What about Google Docs as far as having encryption? Is there any plugin or anything you'd recommend for that? What about Google Docs? Is there a plugin that I can recommend? I can definitely recommend one thing, which is not to have any plugin, to be honest. What happens is these plugins have vulnerabilities, and these get exploited by websites and you might end up having a less secure environment if you are using a third party plugin as opposed to following the best practices of google or the or the any cloud service provider um, how many you recommend any kind of encryption of your google docs that's convenient enough you still use it oh i mean uh, sure just use any encryption use PGP, use anything. It's, but again, you have to worry about the encryption keys, where you're gonna store the encryption key material. Um, so yeah, if you, are, if you have extremely sensitive data uh, in, in Google Cloud or somewhere, then yes, use some client-side encryption. In fact, I will not name that, that service, uh, uh, but I was talking to their CTO and they mentioned that the attackers are going after that service because people are storing their username and password in that service. And that and sometimes people even store their cryptocurrency wallet password, the key in that service. So people are going after that service so that they can compromise this not because of the data and everything else but actually get the credentials and the cryptocurrency wallet. So the question is, have we reached to the point where CSPs, cloud service providers, are too big to fail? Um, I don't think so. I think this is just a start. I mean, there's a lot more things yet to happen. We are just seeing very interesting emergence of paradigms like uh, serverless computing. Uh, is security implications. So it's two. One question is, if AWS went away tomorrow, if it imploded, whatever, what impact would that have on the economy? And would that impact be insufficient to require yeah. intervention? So the comment is that what happens if AWS fails one day? What will be the impact on the economy? I know that I won't be able to watch Netflix, <laughs> but that won't impact the economy. But you are raising a very good point. I think so. I think so. Uh, see, we at Redlog, we, we are a young startup. And based upon the data we collect, I can tell you that so many people are using cloud service in so many different ways that if something were to happen to AWS, uh, 
there you will see a noticeable difference in in some of the uh, in some economies. Uh, that's why, if you are using any cloud service provider, although you have regions like the North Virginia, California, Oregon, and then within the region you have zones A, B, C, D. There are multiple zones. Don't trust your data with only one zone. That zone can go down. More importantly, that region can go down. So keep your copies of the backup in a different region, and if possible, in a different cloud service provider. And I think this is a good point to make right now, because uh, remember I talked about how one company got wiped out because attackers simply deleted their data and the backups, right? But what if that company had their backup on a different cloud that nobody has access to, only one person has access to where the password is stored in some vault? Maybe they could have survived. And guess what? Cloud storage is dirt cheap, really dirt cheap. I, I bet you can store all of your data, your documents, your videos, audios, everything for less than the cost of one coffee for a day, or even less than that. Like It's like cent, like uh, Amazon Glacier is like one cent per GB. It's nothing. So uh, yeah, look into it. I mean, if you have any data, make sure that you have multiple copies of it. Question or comment is that, um, Services like LastPass allows you to store the password uh, on the client side, and it's, it's ultimately the res user responsibility. Um, is it? Uh, yeah, if the user loses the password, nobody can get it. Yeah, if the user loses the password, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Something like a privacy for a blockchain. Yes. Yes. Is that too much security? I mean, should there be an alternative to that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there. So the question is that, uh, what all the if if you lose the password and there is no way to recover that, what are all the options available to you? Could there be an alternative solution to that? What you should do in this scenario? Honestly speaking, there are tons of solutions to solve this problem. But these solutions are very complex for average person to implement. Um, and I think this is where, as a, as a community, uh, we need to build, we need to provide those, we need to come up with those services, some solutions out there which are easy to use. I think that's an area for innovation, where uh, there are uh, protocols available where you don't have to store anything at all. And you can um, trust someone else. And you give that person limited access. And the person can recover the data for you and yet not have access to the data. So there are solutions available, but they are just too complex to implement. And uh, yeah, and that's my, my recommendation. It will always be that that, will, that, will, that can happen. That has happened to the people. In fact, that happened to me. I lost my Dropbox password. I asked Dropbox, hey, please reset my password. They said, uh, you have to click on the link we sent to your email. And I did not have access to the email. So I still have some data in the Dropbox that I cannot access. Obviously, it was not useful data. Uh, but I was, you know, personally, I'm happy. If I cannot access it, that's fine. So, so, so the same, same case with the attacker. Attacker cannot access the same data also. Uh, but if you have some critical data, make multiple copies and uh, uh, make sure that you have written down a very complex password. It's in a safe place, and you don't use it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, one of the slides that I had was we found a lot of enterprises using the root user account. That just points in the, in, in the same direction that if you are using the root credential, which has access to the complete cloud account, and the attacker can do anything, you should not be using it for day-to-day -day operational or management purpose. So create, 
least privileged user and give access based upon that. What machine learning technologies of our company is using to solve this? I can talk to you afterwards. I don't think so. It's the right forum for me to <laughs> talk about uh, things we are doing at Redlock, but I'm happy to chat afterwards. So the question is that, have I come across a, a solution, a formula, uh, or some idea about at what point of time it makes sense to use cloud or not use a cloud, uh, where, where I, you can trade off your operational expense with the, uh, with the agility of the cloud? I don't think that anybody can answer that question. Forget about <laughs> myself attempt, attempting to answer that question, because we have to think about the fundamental reason that you want to use cloud for. If you are using the cloud for agility, for moving fast, you will never be able to compete with the likes of AWS and Azure and Google. They have thousands and thousands and thousands of employees working day and night building services, coming up with ways for you to use the cloud in an easy to use fashion. As an, as an organization, if that's not your business, you will never be able to compete with that. At the same time, but guess what? If you do not need that agility, if you have a fairly static business, you do not care about whether I ship my software every single night or I ship it once a year. I, if you don't care about that, so probably you don't even probably want to use the cloud. You don't need the agility of the cloud. So you can keep continue using your existing environment, and that's completely fine. So, sorry, <laughs> I can't answer that question because I just don't have the data. And it's more of a, I would say, organizational preference as opposed to personal preference. It's, a, it's about how, what will the organization prefer. Uh, I do know, I, mean, I can, uh, like Netflix as an example. Netflix moved everything from on-premise network to AWS, and Netflix competes with Amazon Video, and yet Netflix is still on Amazon, right? We recently heard about how Dropbox moved away from AWS to on-premise network. So these are contradictory data points, and I think we just don't have that data and even if the data is available, it's the organization preference on where they want to invest their resources. Uh, there are organizations which have fair amount of great talent available who can manage cloud, but again, many, many, organization, many organizations do not. And I keep seeing this like, we're gonna move to cloud, oh, now cloud is too expensive, now we're gonna move it back. And they try to move back, oh no, now we are slow, let's move back to the cloud. Um, so, can you tell me uh, of the big banks in the United States, Bank of America, Citibank? Please tell me that none of those are on AWS or other clouds. That they're doing their own private thing. All right. Since you use the word please, so yes, I can say that. <laughs> but the reality is that um, uh, we don't know. We just don't know. Like, we, we don't know who is using what cloud service out there. A lot of the, uh, shadow IT is another big problem in, in, the, in the industry where some developer will simply use his or her credit card, sign up for a cloud service, and then expense it. And the person who approves expense will see that, oh yeah, the person is probably expensive $10, $15, maybe $100. They're not gonna go after the person and ask, okay, what data you have? What, what community servers you are using. So, um, no, no, <laughs> I can't answer that question, but uh, what I know from the shadow IT world, I think uh, shadow IT is a bigger problem than we, than we think about. What I know is that most sensitive, such environments are not using cloud for the primary transactions. The, the, there are just too many security restrictions out there. But what happens is that banks don't really make money anymore from just from transaction. All the checking account and seeing account is they are all free. The way they make money is really by analyzing your data, your spending habit, and then offering you, oh, you 
eat a lot, so here's a restaurant coupon for you, right? <laughs> um, and that, those kind of analysis are better done, or I won't say better done, but people tend to use cloud. Well, thanks everybody for coming, and uh, feel free to reach out to me on email. Thank you. Thank you very much.